name is Joe Phoenix Freedom, and in 2003, I was run over by a semi. I was on a motorcycle at a stop sign, and the whole left side of my body was run over. I was in and out of surgeries, like 49 surgeries in two years. The 50th surgery took my leg back off, and that's kind of where my life started again, because having the leg there was killing me. Well, the backstory was I owned my own construction company and I used to use my motorcycle fit perfectly in this uh, cube truck I had with all my equipment. And the truck had my company name on it and I used to load the motorcycle in the truck and then I could leave the truck on the job site with all the materials and equipment and I had a secure place to lock everything up. Then I would drive my motorcycle back and forth to work when the weather was decent enough, obviously. It was in Iowa. Yeah, I used my motorcycle to get to and from work. It was a convenient way. It was probably six, seven months of the year that I rode it. The rest of the time it was too cold. I live in Iowa. So then you have four wheel drive. But I figured, you know, save the gas. So the day of the accident, I was, I was waiting for the mail. I had to wait for a check from a job that I was having difficulty getting. And the mailman came, it was about quarter after 11. And then I headed off to work on my motorcycle down a gravel road. I lived on a gravel road on a farm. And I got to the paved intersection. There's a stop sign and my feet were on the gravel when I got hit from the right side. The corn was, you know, in September, it's eight feet tall on my motorcycle sitting on the seat, I'm five foot six. I couldn't see around the corn, I looked to the left, that's where you figure traffic comes from. First, look to the right, duck, that was it. The semi was, at least two of its tires were in the gravel on the shoulder on the wrong side of the road when I got hit. And everything does so slow down, like time seems to stop. And I think it's, it's a neurological thing. Your brain speeds up, but it doesn't mean the world is really slowing down. You can see things happening, but you can't do anything about them. You know, I tried to grab the sheathing around the axle, not thinking that a vehicle going that fast is gonna rip my arm off. And it severely damaged my arm and my hand and just about ripped it off. I watched as the trailer tires rolled over and worked their way, the sets of dualies from the tractor worked their way up my body. I was fully conscious and aware the whole time. I remember everything and the first sets of dualies rolled up right over it. My face shield on my helmet shattered. And then I watched the trailer dualies <laughs> roll right up my body. Same thing. As it rolled over my head and the last set of tires rolled off my helmet, my helmet came apart in pieces and went flying off. And my leg had been caught between the dualies and it took it right off, pants the cuff, the whole nine yards. Somehow I lost my left shoe I don't know why that came off, but it did. My motorcycle was still running. The semi moved back over into the appropriate lane and then slowed down. It was pretty close to a mile away and the driver got out and slowly started walking back towards me. And I'm trying to shout over the wind and the corn, you know, that I definitely need an ambulance. <laughs> and he couldn't hear me. He continued slowly walking towards me and he finally got up to me and I'm like, I definitely need an ambulance. And he goes, I can't believe you're alive. I'll go get you one. And I have this never ending sense of humor and it really does never end. My brain is asking me, what's he gonna do? Go chase one down? I told him my cell phone's in my pants pocket on my leg right over there. It's about 15 feet away and he continued walking to his truck. I do have a bit of a medical background I know once the femoral artery is severed, there is a countdown in time and how much time you have. I am watching every heartbeat, you know, spraying out of my leg or what's left of it. Okay, well, I'll go get my own leg. And I remember knowing full well you're not supposed to move, but I did anyway. And uh, I realized that the left arm was not functional. So I just laid it across my chest and I'm trying to scoot using the right leg and right arm and then I felt the crunch in my back and then my right leg didn't work. And it's like, this is just getting worse and worse here. Well, still gonna go get my cell phone. It never occurred to me the thing wouldn't work. It did. I got to it and then I, you know, I picked up my leg, put it on my chest. I'm looking at my bottom of my left shoe. 
crossed my arm over the leg and I'm digging in this cargo pocket of uh, my work like their khaki pants and they've got the cargo pockets and I'm digging in there for the cell phone. I pulled it out and I saw the screen was pretty cracked. Oh, well, let's see, you know, 911. And this is back before the E911 days, you know, 2003. They had no GPS really in phones. So they didn't know where I was. It's like, okay, I am on county in a road N65. The first road you come to is N65, turn left. Go five miles, stop. I'm in the middle of the road. Please don't run me over. And then uh, somebody else had pulled up in a car. I could hear them talking behind me, two females. One of them had taken the cell phone from me, talked to him for a little bit, and then handed me back the cell phone. And they it hung up. And uh, I remember thinking, well, I better call my son's dad because I'm not walking this one off. You know, this is going to be a little bit before I'm back on my feet. And... It's it, To me, it was the right thing to do. And I called him and I told him that I have, you know, been in an accident. I'm going to be in the hospital for a little bit. You know, if you want to make arrangements to come and get our son, I would understand that. I mean, he's going to be cared for regardless. You know, he's asking me all these questions and I'm like, I'm still laying on the road bleeding. So I can't answer your questions yet. And I told him I got to call Michael and I got to call Jen. That was my girl. You know, I called Jen you know, told her that I had been in an accident, and then I called my pastor because I knew he would pick up Jen and my son, Michael, and take him to his house. The first responder that showed up, he was just a kid. If he was 19 or 20, I'd be surprised. He had no idea what to do. I feel bad for him. He was not expecting that. He was uh, squeezing my left hand, which was crushed. I had already established that part of it was detached. I had started to pull my glove off and realized I had a flip top hand, you know, and he's squeezing it and it's like, he's like, squeeze my hand if it hurts, squeeze my hand if it hurts. And I'm like, dude, let go of my hand, it hurts. <laughs> you know, I felt kind of bad for him because he didn't know what to do. And he's like, I'll go get you a blanket. And he put it under my head like a pillow. And it's like, I'm kind of getting cold now because more of my blood is on the road than in my body. I remember finally hearing the ambulance and uh, being relieved that someone was gonna get there that knew what they were doing because this poor first responder had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. They wouldn't listen to me because the ambulance had given me morphine and as it turns out, I'm allergic to it. So while I could hear them and I knew what they were saying, I was no longer in control of my own medical care. My now ex-husband was and he told the doctor to try to put the leg back on because they were trying to figure out where to send me because they picked me up in an ambulance then picked up a paramedic and then decided that I probably wouldn't survive the ambulance ride to the hospital so they called for a chopper and they drove to the nearest paved intersection no idea where it was loaded me on a helicopter flew me to the local hospital where they tried to stabilize me they put in several IVs and were essentially just trying to squeeze fluid in me to keep my heart beating. They did stick a clamp in my leg and clamp off the femoral artery through some hole that was already there. Then they loaded me on a, went to load me on another chopper and take me to another hospital that was better equipped to handle the injuries. But before they had loaded me, the doctor was talking to my, like I said, now ex-husband, who had said, uh, put the leg back on. And the doctor said, it's probably gonna kill her if we try. There's too much else damaged. I remember my ex telling them I would rather die than live without it. And that is absolutely not true. The body is just a house for the soul. And just like any other house, occasionally it needs a little remodeling, some maintenance. You put a new roof in, you put new windows in, you know, replace the carpeting, paint the wall, you know, stuff changes. And this body was not the one I was born with. You know, we change. And it's not going to be the one I die with because it's going to change. And he knew that. It's just he couldn't live without the leg. It, he couldn't deal with it. They put me on a chopper. They went to load me. I remember seeing the tail of the helicopter and my heart stopped. And then the next thing I knew, no, some nurse is in the, the other hospital screaming for help. I guess they'd given up you know, doing the CPR and they were doing cleanup of the room with what they thought was a body. Then there was a flurry of activity and I was knocked out. 
and there began the, the first surgery. First surgery was 28 hours. What actually happened is they get the, they had given up and called time of death. You know, they loaded me on the helicopter and did CPR the entire way from one hospital to another, you know, about 180 miles away. And upon arrival at the next hospital, they had called time of death. And my first surgery was 28 hours. And basically all they did was try to stop the bleeding and put a few things back together. And then I would be out of surgery for between eight and 12 hours so they could give me more blood. And then I was back in surgery again. And this continued on for a couple of weeks. I don't know what happened. I've read my medical file. Like I said, I come from a little bit of a medical background and the details are kind of blurry. There's the time of death and then there's like a five or six minute gap in the time as stuff is going on in the medical file before they resumed their activities. There's nothing recorded for what happened then. I imagine it, it felt like eternity to the doctors, <laughs> you know, and when they walked out, because she was the only one in the room, this nurse that was picking up stuff off the floor, putting it in a, the red bags. And, you know, I, I remember seeing her running out of the room screaming. Then the next thing I remember is I was absolutely positive I was in some mash unit somewhere. I was hallucinating, seeing, hearing, smelling goats and sheep and dogs and cats walking around like, but I was on so many and so much pain medication. Yeah, I had no idea what was going on. Time for the next couple of months was pretty iffy. I know that at some point in time, I don't remember reading the dates, but I ended up in the Mayo Clinic on a heart-lung bypass because my chest was crushed and it uh, bruised my heart pretty severely and it wasn't keeping its own rhythm. So they decided to induce a coma and uh, put me on the bypass. And then they would occasionally sort of wake me up and, but I don't know when I, my sense of time was gone at that point. I could not understand what people were saying. I was really good with languages before the accident. I could pick up a language really quick and easy. I, I would understand a word or two of what they were saying, but I didn't know all of it. And no one stopped to talk to me and tell me or check to see if I even understood what was going on, but I'd start saying something and they didn't understand me because it wasn't all coming out in English. The language part of my brain mixed up all the languages I knew and it came out pretty garbled, like one word is one language, and next word is another language, and so on down the line. It made it very difficult for them to understand me, and I couldn't understand them, so whenever I tried to say anything, they just hit that little happy bolus button and gave me another four milligrams of IV Dilaudid until I fell asleep. You know, that was essentially my life for quite a span of time. It was finally an anesthesiologist who spoke five languages himself, who was able to pick up enough of what I was saying to know that it was different languages. I wasn't just being spewing gibberish. My brain was there. And he used to come in to my room every morning and work on teaching me English in one language again. I had to relearn most things. The brain doesn't do well when it's without a blood supply. I remembered that I used to be able to do things I remembered what I, who I was and all that, but I had difficulty speaking. I had difficulty controlling what little movement I had in my body because I was in a body cast basically from here down and then onto this arm to here. And this arm was casted way up over here with the metal rod going between my arm and my body and I'm casted to above the knee on the right side and on the left side, there was just saran wrap because it was in and out of surgery so much, trying to piece together that left leg that there was no point in closing the wound. They just, it looked like saran wrap to me. And the nurse would come in with a needle, I'm not kidding you about this long, stick it through the saran wrap into the leg and drain the fluid out in between surgeries because fluid kept building up in it. And like I said, the, the time frame for when different things happened isn't totally straight in my brain. Just because 
there were so many surgeries and I would be knocked out and woke up for a little time and knocked out and woke up for a little time and it wasn't, I lost track of time. I was released and then I ended up going back quite a few times because of infection, gangrene, more surgeries, that kind of thing. So the very first time I left the hospital, I remember going out the door into the, the parking garage thinking about how much it stunk there. Like you could smell the exhaust and it's like, wow, that's bad. People shouldn't be breathing that, you know, is what's going through my head. And I also remember that, you know, it was warm. Dates were not my forte. Like I know I, when I was run over and I know that that was a beautiful, beautiful day, but it was fall. Why is it summer now? What happened? I was pretty confused. Well, there were 49 surgeries prior to the amputation. Infection had set in. I had uh, something called vancomycin resistant osteomyelitis. Basically what it means is we don't have an antibiotic to kill that infection. We can kind of beat it down a little bit with the antibiotic called vancomycin, which is really, really nasty. It's a lot like chemo where your, your whole body aches. You have a lot of the similar chemotherapy side effects because that's in a way it's kind of what it's based on is chemotherapy. It's like a, we're going to introduce this particular infection to this and we're going to hope that we can beat it into submission. But it wasn't working. It was on a pick line, went right into my heart, constantly 24 hours a day. I'm getting this antibiotic and it was making me sicker and sicker and sicker. Between that and the infection in my leg, it finally got to the point where there was no bone left. They had grafted in cadaver bone. They had uh, taken that out and put these spacer blocks. They're antibiotic filled, almost like concrete. And they had implanted those, but it wasn't stopping the infection. And I remember talking to my surgeon and I had asked him, you know, will you just cut it off now? It's never going to be a leg. It's never going to work. I'm never going to walk on it. So what is a leg is defined by what it does, not what it looks like. And I had asked him, you know, if your hand was crushed, you're a surgeon. It was never going to work as a hand again, but you could get a prosthetic that would allow you to still be a surgeon. What would you do? And that was before the 50th surgery. And when he, when I woke up from surgery, he's sitting on the edge of my bed, looking at his hands, crying because he had to take the leg off. I reached down, felt the leg was gone, and it really was a thank God moment. It's finally gone. Now my life can begin. I was still on the vancomycin for another three months, but then I was off that. The gangrene was gone from my leg, and I got to go home for more than a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It was the first time in two and a half years. Only I had no home to go home to because while I was in the hospital or rehab or whatever, um, my house burned down. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up going back to Duluth. I was there for a couple of months and then I bought a house in Iowa and moved back to Iowa. I had family and friends in Duluth. Um, when I had gotten out of the hospital, I got a call from the uh, police department and they were asking me where I was that weekend and I'm like in the hospital I had surgery and they're wanting proof of that and it's like uh, you want to call my doctor I've got his cell phone number <laughs> you know you can call the hospital and ask about HIPAA anyway he wanted me to meet him at my farm property and I'm like I don't drive you understand I'm in a body cast, right? How about you come here? I was staying at a, a friend of mine's from church. He was out of town and I was staying in his house. Well, it was confusing to me. But yeah, as far as the house burning down, I don't know a lot of the details. I had talked to the police officer. He wanted me to go out to the property and I explained that I just got out of surgery. I don't drive. And I ended up getting a friend of mine, took me out there, talked to him and he's like, well, uh, would you take a lie detector test? And I'm like, and then he tells me, you know, don't think, don't think you can beat it. And I'm like, I'm lucky I know my name right now. There's no illusion I'm going to beat it. And I, the fire had occurred the previous weekend when I was in the hospital and I, that was no problem for him to verify that. 
So it was a complete loss. It was just a foundation left, that's it. My girl, Jen, she would go out there on weekends, but she stayed at the pastor's house in Fort Dodge during the week. But that weekend, she didn't. I was under the assumption that my now ex-husband was living in the house. That was what I understood because he said he couldn't come to the hospital because he had to work. So I thought he was living in the house. As it turns out, he had moved in with his girlfriend. So there was no one living there. It never occurred to me that my life was gonna end. Remember my doctor had told me you'll never walk. Your spinal column was severed. I didn't believe it. I did it, it. I never doubted in my mind that I would walk again someday. It didn't believe it for a second. I knew I would. But when I could finally got a lot of the casting off, the leg was gone. I was off the vancomycin. I was finally out of the hospital. I bought a little house in a small town. I was looking for a rock to crawl under and boy, did I find it. And I gradually was able to start living. I used to take my dog, who was my transportation, in a wheelchair, slightly modified, he, I didn't have a stove in the house yet, but he would pull me up to the local bar grill type thing and I'd have dinner there and then bring the rest of it home and we'd go home. And one of the regulars in the bar had decided I was going to gala days and I saw the pool tape. I love pool. It's really difficult to play pool when you're in a wheelchair. So I learned how to walk around that pool table and my girl had come home from college. We set up a Christmas tree and I made my first step to hang ornaments on that Christmas tree. And then it was like, well, gee, if I can take one step, I can take two. If I can take two, I can take three. It's walking's a little different because I don't feel most of my left leg is, or my right leg. And well, the left leg is gone. So it's, it's different but I can. Well, I broke my prosthetic doing stuff I probably shouldn't have been doing, like picking up a refrigerator. They have a weight limit, you know? I broke it, picking up a fridge. So for now, it's me and my skinny friends called crutches. A friend of mine bought me one of those little carts that you put your leg on when you break the lower part of your leg, that you can, it's got handles and you, put your leg across this padded thing and you kind of scoot around using the other leg rather than using crutches. And I actually raised the seat and I sit on that to carry my laundry to back and forth to the washer and dryer to carry things through the house. Or I sit down on my backside, put the stuff on my lap and scoot across the floor. You figure out ways to do things. Well, right now, I my prosthetic is broken and I don't feel a lot of my right leg. The left leg is gone and prosthetic is broken. So walking is very different than it used to be. I am 48 year, years old now. It's been over 20 years since the accident. And I bought a house, remodeled it, complete with gutting a bathroom. I mean, we're talking down to the, the floor joists and redid it. Some of the stuff I did need help with, like I cannot pick up a toilet and walk across the room. That's not, not in my forte anymore. I refinished a hardwood floor with a six inch uh, circular sander because you cannot operate a floor sander without two legs. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how many different ways I tried to do it, can't do it. So you figure out a different way. A friend of mine, she flips houses for a living and I've done a lot of work for her. Even without the prosthetic, there's still you figure out a way. I enjoy my life. I have two Huskies that I am actually training to, well, one of them. The other one doesn't have the personality for it. They're both kind of rescues. I have a never ending sense of humor. I love life and overall I'm, I'm happy. But one thing that I learned when I was going through rehab, so I got to see lots of different people coming in and talking with all these different people. What I learned is everyone has their struggles. It's no more difficult for someone else and their struggle than it is for the next person and theirs. People, you know, will see me and they think they know what 
my struggle is, when in all reality they have no idea because they see the physical issue and that's not what I struggle with in life. The body is just a house for the soul, nothing more. So, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself. The next person is struggling in their life just as hard as you are. And don't give up because tomorrow isn't written yet. And when you allow what happened in the past to keep you down, it's like you're allowing something that happened in the past that you can't change to damage your current, your present, and destroy your future. And that's not what life was supposed to be. You know, it was grab the bull by the horns and Hang on, because you're going for a ride for a little bit, but eventually the bull will get tired and you'll get your own feet back on the ground again, or foot in my case. But either way, you know, life goes on. Live it and love it. Make the best of everything.